Chapter 2. Pediatric, Respiratory, Anatomy and Physiology. So in this chapter, we're going to look at the anatomy of the child's lung, the child respiratory system, the anatomy of a child's lung and breathing, that's inspiration and expiration, differences in pediatric pulmonary anatomy to adult pulmonary anatomy, respiratory volumes and capacities, and respiratory physiology in children. Now, I know that for some of you, this will be a little bit of a recap, but sit back and enjoy anyway, and let's just refresh ourselves on respiratory anatomy and physiology to orient our minds to spirometry. So the educational aims of this chapter are that you will be able to recall normal anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, identify general functions of the respiratory system, name and describe the organs and their functions in the respiratory system, explain how inspiration and expiration are accomplished, describe the muscles in normal breathing as well as in the forced vital capacity maneuver, examine the influence of lung compliance and elastic recoil on respiration, identify the factors affecting airflow resistance, explain the mucociliary escalator, Describe each of the respiratory volumes and capacities. Describe the differences in pediatric to adult respiratory anatomy. And explain pediatric respiratory physiology. Let's look first of all at the anatomy of the child's lung. The anatomy of a child's lung is very similar to that of an adult, but young children have different respiratory physiology compared to older children and adults. The lungs are a pair of air-filled organs consisting of spongy tissue called lung parenchyma. Three lobes or sections make up the right lung, and the two lobes make up the left lung. The lungs are located on either side of the thorax or chest and function to allow the body to receive oxygen and to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is the waste gas from metabolism. So to understand the anatomy of the pediatric lung and lung disease in children, it is important to take a look at the entire respiratory system. So let's look at the anatomy of the pediatric respiratory system divided into two parts. So firstly, let's look at pediatric anatomy. So outside of the thorax, that is the chest cavity, the airways include the supraglottic, which is the epiglottis, the glottic airway opening of the trachea, and the infraglottic trachea regions. The intrathoracic airway includes the trachea, two main stem bronchi, all the bronchi and bronchioles that conduct air to the alveoli, and the main function is conducting air in and out of the lungs. Then we look at the pediatric lung anatomy. So lung anatomy includes the lung parenchyma, which is the portion of the lung where gas exchange takes place and it is subdivided into lobes and segments that are made up of the smallest airways, which are the respiratory bronchioles, the alveoli, and the alveolar ducts. So all of this can be looked at in figure 2.1. The respiratory system is a complex biological system comprised of several organs that facilitate the inhalation and exhalation of oxygen and carbon dioxide in living organisms. For all air-breathing vertebrates, respiration is handled by the lungs, but these are far from the only components of the respiratory system. In fact, the system is composed of the following biological structures, the nose, the nasal cavity, the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, the lungs, and the muscles of respiration. So respiration and breathing, those two terms, what is the difference between them? So respiration is a multi-step process involving the respiratory system, the circulatory system and the tissue cells. Unfortunately, the word respiration is often used instead of breathing, which can be confusing. When it is used in its technical sense, the term respiration refers to more than just breathing. Respiration is often said to involve four processes. The respiratory system is involved in the first two steps. So breathing, another name for breathing is ventilation, the inhalation of oxygen and the exhalation of carbon dioxide. External respiration, which is gas exchange between the lungs and the bloodstream, 
whereby oxygen leaves the lungs, goes into the bloodstream, while carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction. Internal respiration is gas exchange between the bloodstream and the tissue cells. Oxygen leaves the bloodstreams, enters the tissue cells, whilst carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction. And lastly, cellular respiration. And this is the chemical reaction between oxygen and carbohydrates inside the tissues of the cells. So let's look in more detail at each one of the anatomical components of the respiratory system. So starting with the nose and the nasal cavity. So the nose and the nasal cavity constitute the main external opening of the respiratory system. Although the nose is typically credited as being the main external breathing apparatus, its role is actually to provide support and protection to the nasal cavity. The cavity is lined with mucous membranes and little hairs that can filter the air before it goes into the respiratory tract. These hairs tra trap harmful particles such as dust, molds, pollens, and prevents them from reaching any of the internal components of the respiratory system. At the same time, the cold outside air that we breathe is warmed up and moistened before going through the respiratory tract. During exhalation, the warm air that is eliminated returns the heat and moisture back to the nasal cavity. So this forms a continuous process. The oral cavity, which is the mouth, is the only other external component that is part of the respiratory system. The function of the mouth is to supplement inhalation of air, particularly when the nose is obstructed. So the mouth does not possess the ability to sufficiently warm the air breathed in, and it also lacks the filter that the nose provides. The pathway leading from the mouth is shorter, the diameter is wider, and this means that more air can enter the body through the mouth. The pharynx is a funnel made from muscles that act as an intermediary between the nasal cavity and the larynx and esophagus. The epiglottis is a little flap that performs a vital task by switching access between the esophagus and the trachea. This ensures that air will travel through the trachea, but that food which is swallowed and travels through the pharynx is diverted to the esophagus. The trachea connects the laryngopharynx to the trachea. It is located near the anterior section of the neck, just below the hyoid bone. The epiglottis is part of the larynx as are the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the vocal folds. Both cartilages offer support and protection to other components, such as the vocal folds and the larynx itself. The vocal folds are mucous membranes that tense up and vibrate in order to create sound, hence the term voice box. The pitch and volume of these sounds can be controlled by modifying the tension and speed of the vocal folds. The trachea is a longer section of the respiratory tract that has several C-shaped hyaline cartilaginous rings which are lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. The trachea is more commonly referred to as the windpipe and it connects the larynx to the bronchi. The role of the trachea is in filtering the air prior to the air entering the lungs. Looking at the bronchi, the lower end of the trachea splits the respiratory tract into two branches that are named the primary bronchi. These first run into each of the lungs before further branching off into smaller bronchi. These secondary bronchi continue carrying the air to the lobes of the lungs, then split further into tertiary bronchi. The tertiary bronchi then split into even smaller sections that are spread out through the lungs called bronchioles. Each one of these bronchioles continues to split into even smaller parts called terminal bronchioles. At this stage, these tiny bronchioles number in the millions and are less than one millimeter in length and work to conduct the air to the lungs alveoli. The larger bronchi contain C-shaped cartilaginous rings like the ones in the trachea that keep the airway open. As the bronchi get smaller, so do the rings that become progressively more widely spaced. The tiny bronchioles do not have any kind of cartilage and instead rely on muscles and elastins. This branching system ensures that the air from the trachea reaches all regions of the lungs.
Besides simply carrying the air, the bronchi and bronchioles also possess mucus and cilia that further refine the air and get rid of any leftover environmental contaminants. The walls of the bronchi and the bronchiole contain muscle tissue, which can control the flow of air going into the lungs. In certain circumstances, such as during physical activity, cause the muscles to relax, allowing more air to go into the lungs. In other instances, the muscles can contract, reducing airflow through the lungs. So the main site of airway resistance in the adult is in the upper airway. However, it has been shown that in peripheral airway resistance in children younger than five years of age is four times higher than in adults. The major site of airway resistance in children is in the medium-sized bronchi. The lungs are located inside the thorax and the lungs are surrounded by two membranes known as the pleural membranes. The parietal pleura, which is the outer membrane, is attached to the inner wall of the thoracic cavity. The visceral pleura, which is the inner membrane, is directly attached to the outer surface of the lungs themselves. The parietal and visceral pleura are closely applied to each other and lubricated so that they glide easily over each other during respiration. The very small space between the two pleural membranes is known as the pleural space, and in health, it's a potential space. It is this space that is important in the transmission of pressure changes during respiration. Because the left lung is located lateral to the heart, the organs are not identical. The left lung is smaller and has only two lobes, while the right lung has three lobes. Inside the lungs resemble a sponge made of millions and millions of small sacs that are named alveoli. These alveoli are found at the ends of terminal bronchioles and are surrounded by capillaries through which blood passes. Gas exchange also takes place at this alveolar capillary interface, allowing oxygen entry into the blood in exchange for carbon dioxide. The lung matrix of a neonate contains only small amounts of collagen. The elastin to collagen ratio changes during the first months and years of life and affects lung stiffness and potential for over distension and recoil. Lung recoil increases with age in children over six years of age because they have more elastin at that stage. So just a little note to remember. The membranes surrounding the lungs are important for transmitting the pressure changes that produce inflation of the lungs during respiration. Conditions that result in the presence of fluid or air between the pleural membranes will reduce normal respiratory movements and produce abnormal restrictive spirometry patterns. Looking at the muscles of respiration, the last component of the respiratory system is the rib cage, with muscles collectively called the muscles of respiration. And these muscles surround the lungs and allow for inhalation and exhalation of air. The main muscle in this system is known as the diaphragm, a thin sheet of muscle that constitute the bottom of the thorax. It pulls air into the lungs by contracting several inches with each breath and relaxes during expiration, which is passive at rest. In addition to the diaphragm, multiple intercostal muscles are located between the ribs and they also help compress and expand the lungs. In forced inspiration and expiration, as happens during the forced vital capacity maneuver in spirometry, additional accessory muscles are used and these are the sternomastoid and scalene muscles, which are the neck muscles, on inspiration, and then the abdominal muscles on expiration. So if you pause for a moment, put your hands on your neck muscles here and take a deep, fast breath in. <sighs> Can you feel these muscles working in your neck here? All right, and in the same way, you've breathed in to fill your lungs. Now put your fingers on your stomach muscles and blast the air out as fast as you can. <sighs> and feel your stomach muscles working. All right, so those are the accessory muscles of respiration, and those are the muscles that work hard when you're doing a spirometry maneuver. So expiration is normally a passive process. So when you're just breathing normally at rest,
expiration is a passive process with the relaxation of the diaphragm and contraction of external intercostal muscles. Now, another difference in pediatric and adult um, anatomy is that the orientation of the ribs is horizontal in an infant. So by 10 years of age, the orientation is downwards. Ossification of the rib cage, calcification of the costal cartilage, and development of muscular mass develops progressively until adulthood. Just a little note, any diseases that affect the bones or muscles of the respiratory system will reduce the ability of the lungs to expand and will affect your spirometry results by lowering the FVC. Right, now let's have a further look at the physiology of the respiratory system. So let's start by looking at the mechanics of breathing. So the action of breathing in and out is due to changes of pressure within the thorax in comparison with outside. This action is known as external respiration when we inhale, the intercostal muscles between the ribs and the diaphragm contract to expand the chest cavity. The diaphragm flattens and moves downwards and the intercostals move the rib cage upwards and out. This increase in size decreases the internal air pressure, so air from the outside at a now higher pressure than that inside the thorax rushes into the lungs to equalize the pressures. When we exhale, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles relax again and return to their resting positions. This reduces the size of the thoracic cavity, thereby increasing the pressure and forcing the air out of the lungs. The rate and depth at which we inhale and exhale is controlled by the respiratory center within the medulla oblongata in the brain. Inspiration occurs due to increased firing of inspiratory nerves and so the increased recruitment of motor units within the intercostals and diaphragm. Exhalation, on the other hand, occurs due to a sudden stop in impulses along the inspiratory nerves. Our lungs are prevented from excess inspiration due to stretch receptors within the bronchi and the bronchioles, which send impulses to the medulla oblongata in the brain when stimulated and the chest wall. Our breathing rate is controlled by chemoreceptors within the main arteries, which monitor the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide within the blood. If oxygen saturation falls, ventilation accelerates to increase the volume of oxygen inspired. If levels of carbon dioxide increase, a substance known as carbonic acid is released into the blood, which causes the hydrogen ions to be formed. An increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood stimulates increased ventilation rates, and this also occurs when lactic acid is released into the blood following high-intensity exercise. Breathing rate can also be consciously increased or decreased. Now, very importantly, when it comes to understanding spirometry, we need to just say a quick word on lung compliance and elastic recoil on respiration. So lung compliance is the ability of the lungs to expand. Low compliance indicates a stiff lung and means extra work is required to bring in a normal volume of air. This occurs as the lungs, in this case, become fibrotic, so they lose their distensibility and they become stiffer. In a highly compliant lung, as in emphysema, the elastic tissue is damaged by enzymes. So elastic recoil is the ease at which the lungs spring back after having been expanded. Elasticity is the opposite or reciprocal of compliance, a measure of the resistance of the system to expand. Elasticity occurs because of the elastin in the elastic fibers in the connective tissue of the lungs and because of the surface tension of the film of fluid that lines the alveoli. The elasticity of the lungs is affected by many respiratory diseases. The infant chest wall is remarkably compliant and compliance decreases with increasing age. So the elastic recoil of an infant's chest wall is close to zero and with age increases because of the progressive ossification of the rib cage and increased intercostal muscle tone.
So the factors that affect respiratory airflow resistance. Airway resistance is the resistance of the respiratory tract to airflow during inhalation and expiration. Airway resistance cannot be measured by spirometry, but it is measured by other pulmonary function tests, one being body plethysmography. So a little note is that as the lung expands during inspiration, the diameter of the airways increases. As the lung volume reduces during expiration, the airway diameter is also reduced. Let's look at the mucociliary escalator. So the mucociliary escalator covers most of the bronchi, bronchioles, and the nose. It is composed of two basic parts, the mucus producing goblet cells and ciliated epithelium. So the cilia are tiny little hairs in the airways that are continually beating, pushing mucus up and out into the throat. The mucociliary escalator is a major barrier against infection. Microorganisms hoping to infect the respiratory tract are caught in the sticky mucus in the airway and moved up by the mucociliary escalator. Smoking and passive exposure to tobacco smoke can affect the mucociliary escalator, making these people more prone to uncleared secretions and infection. So excess mucus production of mucus and or its retention within the airways can give rise to obstructive spirometry. Repeated infection and prolonged inflammation as a result of impaired mucociliary defenses can produce permanent changes to the structure of the airways that are reflected in the spirometry test. Now, let's have a good look at the respiratory volumes and capacities. So, a respiratory volume is an amount of air inhaled, exhaled, and stored within the lungs at any one given time. So the basic lung volumes, there are four of them. So the first one is the tidal volume. So the tidal volume is the air that is moved in and out of the lungs with each normal rested breath. And inspiratory reserve volume, this is the air that can be forcibly breathed out over and above a tidal inspiration. So after you've breathed in, in a normal breath, any air that you can breathe in over and above that is the inspiratory reserve volume. The expiratory reserve volume is similar, except that it's on exhalation. So that is the air that can be forced out of the lungs over and above a normal tidal breath out. And then lastly, the residual volume is the air left in the lungs after complete expiration. So remember when you're doing a spirometry test, the patient will breathe into total lung capacity, they will blast the air out as fast and hard as they can until they get to residual volume. So there will still always be an amount of air left in the airways and the lungs at the end of a forced expiration in spirometry. And this is due to the surfactant in the alveoli, keeping the alveoli open. It's due to the quality of the tissue of the airway itself and to the cartilaginous rings in the trachea as well. So there will always be a residual volume of air left at the end of a spirometric maneuver, which cannot be measured on spirometry. That is measured by other tests. Let's have a quick look at the basic lung capacities. So a capacity is made up of one or more lung volumes. The inspiratory capacity is a combination of the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. The functional residual capacity is the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. The vital capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. And then lastly, the total lung capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume, plus the residual volume. So the total lung capacity is the total volume of air inhaled at the starting point of a spirometry test result. Differences in pediatric pulmonary anatomy versus that of an adult. So while the basic anatomy of the pediatric lung and the adult lung are the same, there are some important differences that we shouldn't overlook and which will help us to understand pediatric spirometry better. These differences can increase the occurrence and severity of lung disease and respiratory issues in young children 
and impact treatments and techniques that are most effective. So differences in pediatric pulmonary anatomy. The ribs in infants and young children are oriented more horizontally than in adults and older children, lessening the movement of the chest. Rib cartilage is more springy in children, making the chest wall less rigid. And this can allow the chest wall to retract during episodes of respiratory distress and decrease the tidal volume. The intercostal muscles that run between the ribs are not fully developed until a child reaches school age or so. This can make it difficult to lift the rib cage, especially when lying flat on the back. The back of a child's head is typically larger than that of an adult, and this can cause the neck to flex when a child is lying on his or her back and result in a partially obstructed airway. Infants and children tend to have a proportionally larger tongue in relation to the space in the mouth. Young children are typically nose breathers. The internal diameter of the airways in a child is smaller and any inflammation or obstructive can cause more severe distress than it would in an older child or an adult. In general, pediatric airways are smaller, less rigid and more prone to obstruction. And lastly, children have higher respiratory rates than adults, making them more susceptible to agents in the air. The anatomy of a child's lungs and other components of the pulmonary system make treating pediatric lung disease a very specialized practice. Children are unique and effective treatments and approaches need to be as well. So to finish off this chapter, well done on concentrating this far. Let's just look at a few did you know? So one thing you need to know is that spirometry is safe and it's quick to perform. With the correct coaching, almost all children are able to correctly perform the test. Spirometry is reproducible. The results are available in immediately. Spirometry results can be compared with normal reference values, allowing detection and quantification of abnormal lung function. Spirometer performance and testing methods have been standardized. So that makes it very easy for us to, to get standardized results. A spirometry test starts at total lung capacity, the point at which the lungs are full, 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 and it ends at the start of residual volume when every last bit of air has been breathed out of the lungs as forcibly as possible. Another name for the start of the test is the total lung capacity and the, the name for the end of the test could be residual volume, indicating that we've breathed out all the air and that what left is now a residual volume. Exhalation is a passive action, so as the lungs recoil and shrink, when the muscles relax. Each lung holds about 300 million alveoli, creating a surface area the size of a tennis court. And we need a huge surface area in the lungs for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. You are able to produce sounds because of the air that you breathe. The vocal cords are found in the larynx and allow you to speak. Air passes over those folds and they vibrate and it is these vibrations that are heard as sound. During inhalation, the diaphragm, which is the thin sheet of dome-shaped muscle that separates the chest and abdominal cavities, that diaphragm contracts, moves down, increases the space in the chest cavity and reduces the pressure in the chest. At the same time, the muscles between the ribs contract, pull the rib cage upwards and outwards and air is sucked into the chest. During exhalation, the exact opposite occurs. So the respiratory system does more than simply move oxygen into and out of our lungs. The structure of the respiratory system interacts with the structures of the skeletal, circulatory and muscular systems to help us to smell, speak, move oxygen um, into and out of the bloodstream. In healthy people, age-related reductions in lung function seldom lead to symptoms but they can contribute to an older person's reduced ability to do vigorous exercise. Asthma once upon a time was treated with psychotherapy, but modern science has shown that asthma is a chronic lung disease because the airways become inflamed and narrowed. It is a physical illness that can be exacerbated by psychological factors. Between the 1930s and 1950s, however, 
people thought that the roots of asthma were psychological. Therefore, treatments for asthma focused mainly on psychoanalysis. Therapists even interpreted a child's asthmatic wheezing as a suppressed cry for his or her mother. And I can say that knowing that, I'm very glad that I didn't have asthma back in the 1930s, 1950s. Thank you very much, and we will soon move on to chapter three.